as a um, weather and climate phenomenon. There are also plenty of potential overlaps between climate change policy and what agriculture might doing, be doing in terms of carbon sequestration and so forth. Um, that's a different talk. My talk is focusing on um, taking advantage of knowledge of and adapting to changes in weather and climate patterns. Our perception of climate has evolved quite a bit over the past couple hundred years. Back in, say, the year 1800, we had something called the climate, which was the average conditions of the weather. And there was no particular reason to think that climate at that point was different from the climate 100 years ago, climate 200 years ago, other than you know, perhaps old timers would say, I remember back when the Thames used to freeze over. And so the uh, awareness that exceptional events would happen um, could, could have happened differently in the past, or maybe that was just the rareness of it and just randomness that, that led to certain periods of time being different from other periods of time. Uh, the real change in perception of climate, at least in Europe, took place when um, mountaineering started being popular. People started visiting the Alps, the, the wild wilderness became a tourist attraction, and it was noticed that there were clear changes in um, glaciers. There was evidence that glaciers used to be a lot bigger in the past than they were at the present time. And so, um, as, as time went on, evidence was found in other locations. And so, by the turn of the 20th century, people were aware that in the distant past, the climates had been considerably different. We'd gone through glacial periods, um, interglacial periods, and as knowledge built up after that, uh, that uh, even that wasn't the, the typical situation for the Earth in geologic time. Uh, it wasn't really until about the year 1900 that we started having um, really global scale observations of the climate. Um, technology and uh, uh, spread of colonization allowed that to happen. Um, but it wasn't until the latter half of the 20th century that um, people um, really became aware of the possibility that the climate might actually be changing at the present day. Um, because, well, I mean, the sun still at that point was thought of as being a constant heat source. But there were things happening in the atmosphere that were certainly had the potential of affecting the climate. Um, changes in carbon dioxide and other gases. Um, changes in haze, what's known as particulate matter or aerosols, which could potentially cool the planet. And uh, there was also even the possibility that we were starting down the several hundred or several thousand year process of entering the next glacial cycle. So um, we became aware that we might be doing something to the climate unintentionally, but it wasn't clear exactly what or even exactly what direction the climate might be going in. Uh, by now, it's, it's uh, pretty well pinned down that the climate has changed over the past um, 100, 150 years in a significant manner. Um, that it, it, it is changing depending upon what time scale you look at. From one year to the next, it might go, temperatures might go up or down, but looked at over multi-decade periods, um, we have uh, the Earth basically being warmer now by, by over a degree Fahrenheit than it was 100 years ago, um, which is not a big change. But because we also know scientifically what's causing that change to, to a great extent, um, and we know how those causes are going to be um, changing in the future, we can say something about the climate going forward, which is when knowledge starts becoming useful. 
Uh, agriculture producers always have made use of knowledge of the future conditions of the atmosphere. Uh, here's the five-day forecast for uh, this region of Texas that I have grabbed from the web on Wednesday. Um, farmer wouldn't dream of doing something out in the field without taking into account what the weather forecast was for that day for the next few days. It could be critical to the success of whatever application they were planning or whatever they were, they were going to do. And that's a perfectly ordinary thing to do. It's become quite commonplace to imagine that the forecast five days into the future is going to be pretty reliable. That wasn't always the case. Um, go back 30 years and you were lucky if a three-day forecast was as accurate as today's five-day forecasts are. But as we're learning more about the climate, uh, we're not necessarily limited to a five-day planning range. Um, we're certainly limited in terms of the precision at which we can say what's going to happen. We know we, we, we have a good sense, in this case, that the weekend is going to be partly cloudy. We certainly don't know whether the weekend but this time next year is going to be partly cloudy, but we do know quite a bit. So imagine, if you will, the current five-year planner, which uh, says what we know about the climate going forward the next five years. Uh, and this is not um, speculative, uh, except to the extent I express ranges of possibilities, and this is actually a real five-year planner as I would put together right now for Texas going forward, but I use an example of that we actually know things about what's going to happen a year, two years, three years from now. Um, I can go into details in the Q&A period if you want to, but this takes into account things like El Nino and La Nina, which have a significant impact on what's going to happen in a given year. It also takes into account long-term trends in temperature and rainfall to the extent to which those are actually moving the expectations of what might happen. And just as um, knowledge of what's going to happen in the next few days is useful and profitable, so too is knowledge of what's going to happen next year and the year after that because most of the, or many of the big money decisions the producers make are decisions that rely on uh, payoffs six months, a year, two years, even five or ten years down the road. So whatever we can say about the future climate is useful and potentially profitable information. So I want to spend the rest of the talk giving some examples about what we can say about future climate and uh, how that information might be used. So for starters, right now we're in the middle of what may turn out to be the strongest El Nino on record. Uh, we won't know for another few months because the official historical records are made using a pretty comprehensive data set, but the weekly updates that are coming out, sort of the quick look data, indicate that right now it's as high in terms of the warmth of the tropical Pacific as it's ever been. And there are multiple ways of using that information. Um, our knowledge uh, from the meteorology perspective comes from looking at historical occurrences of El Nino as well as looking at computer forecasts of how the atmosphere and the ocean are going to evolve together and how the ocean is going to be influencing the atmosphere that goes forward. Right now, um, I would say that uh, probably about half of the global models that are presently being used to make that sort of forecast um, have a decent enough representation of El Nino to actually be able to make useful forecasts. And for the other half, I really wouldn't trust them. Uh, the Climate Prediction Center looks at all of the information and tries to come up with the best solution. So they put out the official forecast for the climate going forward. 
Um, looking at historical cases is the easiest thing to do and is also the most straightforward thing for a producer to understand. You don't need to know the dynamics of the atmosphere to know that last time a really strong El Nino happened, rainfall was um, close to normal, which is actually what this chart's showing. Uh, the first 12 columns are accumulated rainfall for October, November, December, January, February, March, April, so seven uh, cool months of the year. Uh, for the 12 strongest El Ninos, ranked by strength. So the strongest was 1982 to 1983, um, and then we go down to 12 of them. Uh, the first column on the right-hand side of this line is the normal for statewide precipitation during a typical year. And you can compare that to three different aggregations of past years, the two strongest, the six strongest, the 12 strongest. So all three of those aggregations, two strongest, six strongest, and 12 strongest, are um, above that horizontal line, which represents normal. So that means that on average, El Nino in Texas produces greater than normal precipitation. It's not terribly strongly correlated with the strength of El Nino once you're up to at least a reasonably strong one because the two strongest actually were pretty close to normal. You can see that in the individual instances, 82, 83, and 97, 98. You can also see from a diagram such as this, the sort of variability there is from one El Nino year to the next. You can see what variability might occur uh, from one month to the next. Just because on average Februarys are about 50% wetter than normal doesn't mean you can't have a February that's ridiculously dry but it's typically going to be made up for by a wet January and a wet March. I've also plotted the first month of this year's El Nino, where we're very confident it's going to make the top 12 list, make it a top 13 list, I suppose. Uh, but we're already ahead of the game. We've, got, we've had uh, October and November's normal rainfall already just in the month of October. So uh, uh, you can see, if you look at the details, that uh, those two strong El Ninos back here, which we've averaged together here, actually started off with dry October, and then November, December, January, February were all fairly wet. So we're off to a very good start for having a wet year this time around. Now, to go back to this planner, I've got La Nina listed in the next two years with decreasing confidence in the projection as we go forward. That's because in the past and in climate models, most of the time when you have a very strong El Nino, the, thing, the system rebounds and you end up with a La Nina with colder than normal temperatures in the tropical Pacific. Um, the Climate Prediction Center makes uh, outlooks out to about a year. So at present, there's actually, unfortunately, no official forecast for 2016 through 2018. Uh, but based on past history and based on uh, scientific research, that seems very likely that we'll have La Nina conditions in at least one of those next two years, which means that rainfall will tend to be drier than normal during the cold time of the year. And we can look at, compare the, the El Nino averages here with the instances of La Nina on this chart. Uh, and again, the first uh, column to the right of the vertical line is the normals. And you can see that 11 out of the 12 strongest La Ninas came in below normal for the period October through March. In fact, the average for the six strongest La Nina events statewide was seven inches of rainfall compared to a normal amount of greater than 12. So that's uh, um, the dry side of the impact is potentially 
greater than the wet side impact with an El Nino. And an obvious example of how this knowledge could be used is um, just because things are wet now doesn't necessarily mean it's time to restock the herds and get them up to the size they were before the drought of the early 2010s because uh, we may well be looking at two consecutive dry years down the road. Over the longer term, uh, there are longer term natural variations that take place as well as uh, manifestations of the long term global changes that have been observed. I want to show you examples of that looking at uh, breaking things down by climate division in the state of Texas. Um, ten climate divisions, I've got them color coded here. On uh, some of the graphs you're about to see, you'll see the same color coding. Uh, so pay attention to your favorite division if you're from Texas. Here is uh, December through March precipitation. I've smoothed this to smooth over the El Ninos and La Ninas, look at longer term trends. Each one of the horizontal lines is 20% of the long term average. In many parts of the country, you won't see variations this large on a decade time scale. The drought of the 1950s shows up as being uh, averaging uh, about 70% of the long-term normal. Um, the, the decade around the 1980s and 1990s for December through March came in around 130% of normal. So we're, we've got, in some cases, a factor of two difference between decade average rainfall during one period versus another period. Uh, you see a, a overall a slight upward trend, but it goes, has its ups and downs. And it turns out just like uh, El Nino is playing a big role, as you saw, in what happens from year to year, potentially. Um, something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is sort of the slower version of it, also in the Pacific, has a similar impact except on a decadal scale. So up top is a graph of what's going on in the Pacific. And your eye can do the correlation analysis and see that when the top graph is, is, is above the zero line, precipitation in Texas tends, during December through March tends to be wetter than normal. And when the, when the top graph is down low, it tends to be lower than normal. Recent history, since about the year 2000 or so, although it's a noisy graph, says we should have been having fairly dry winters, and that was in fact true for um, central and southern parts of the state. Uh, perhaps the most critical time of year for rainfall is the, is the spring, the next four months, uh, April through July. Mercifully, this is about the only good, good thing about Texas climate, there isn't a lot of long variation from decade to decade on, uh, on springtime precipitation, although you can see the, 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 the blue and green curves look different from the yellow and red curves which means that North Texas is doing one thing during the spring and South Texas is doing a different thing. And so it's not a, it's not a coincidence if you're an observer to notice that some, some years the squall lines tend to stay in North Texas, other times they tend to go to South Texas. We see that in the data. Uh, let's see, so that leaves August through November. More variability here. Again, a bit of an upward trend. And although the connection is not really as controlling, the Atlantic Ocean has an impact in this time of year. Uh, the Pacific Ocean matters because it sort of affects the position of the jet stream. And so uh, in the winter time when our weather comes from the jet stream, that's when we tend to be uh, influenced by the Pacific. In late summer and fall, our weather is typically coming from the Atlantic Ocean in the form of tropical disturbances or just run-of-the-mill daily thunderstorm activity. And if we plot basically what's going on with tropical Atlantic temperatures, we find um, a bit of a relationship. If we do plug this into a computer model and simulate the weather, we find a connection. And the, the relationship is when the Atlantic's warm, we actually tend to be relatively dry during the late summer months. Essentially, all the thunderstorms are are happening where it's nice and warm, which is over the water and not over the land. And as you can see from this, since about the 
year 1995, 96, the Atlantic Ocean has been running warmer than normal, and we've been having relatively dry summers, um, at least during the latter part of that period also. In fact, um, there's only two historical times when both the long-term variations in the Atlantic and the Pacific have both favored dry conditions in Texas. That was uh, during the 1950s and during the past decade. Uh, overall, you see the 1950s and you see the past decade as, as a couple of dips, which appears to be on top of a slight increase of precipitation of about 5 or 10 percent over the past century. Now, the amount of rainfall change being predicted with climate change is on the order of a few percent. So, uh, bottom line for rainfall, at least uh, total rainfall amounts, is that the natural variability is the thing to worry about if you're doing something that's sensitive to precipitation. Now, in terms of uh, the actual weather, say during the summertime, of course, it's the combination of temperature and precipitation that, that matters. This is a plot of total summertime rainfall from left to right versus precipitation going up. Averaged across Texas, each dot is, is a different year. There's about 121 dots on here. It goes back before 1900. And you can see that this is one of the bad things about Texas climate. When the temperature tends to be high, rainfall tends to be low, and vice versa. And there's, there's physical reasons for that to be the case. It's pretty hard to avoid that. 2011 is the big red dot in the upper left-hand corner, which was record dry and record hot. Um, if you knew it was going to be record dry, you probably would have been able to predict it was going to be record hot based on this graph. And when that happened, people were wondering, is that climate change that we got this record condition? Uh, in large part, no, it wasn't. This, this, uh, those variations represent natural variability. When it's dry, it's going to be hot. And we, as we saw, there is no long-term downward trend in rainfall. But there's more than one red dot here. Actually, all the ones that are color-coded here are the years since 2000. And you can see while we've had both dry years and wet years, all those dots are above the middle of the cluster. And that is climate change. Uh, the tendency for the temperature to be just a little bit warmer by about a degree or so uh, compared to what it would have been in the past for the same amount of cloudiness, the same amount of rainfall. And whether that one degree matters depends upon the specific circumstances. In many cases, it doesn't matter. In some cases, it does. If we look at the long-term variations of temperature across the state, um, for this, we have to, again, break it down into seasons. And uh, here, blue is December, January, February. Green is March, April, May. Summer is June, July, August in red, and then brown is uh, the fall. The solid lines are the uh, daily maximum temperatures compared to the long-term average. The dotted lines are the daily minimum temperatures compared to the long-term average. And it really doesn't matter which season you're looking at, because you know, carbon dioxide has gone up in all seasons. So what we see in Texas, for example, is um, really wouldn't want to fit a straight line to this. It's a little bit more interesting than that. It was going up slowly during the first half of the century. Then we hit this stretch in the 1970s and early 1980s, which was the coldest period on record for, in most seasons. And since about 1980, temperatures have, have increased by a couple of degrees. Um, we can break this down into different regions and see different things. And I'll use that to focus on how different aspects of this can provide actionable information. So for example, here's the same set of graphs for the Texas High Plains from the, from the Oklahoma Panhandle on down to Midland, basically. And 
One thing that catches my eye on this is the March, April, May curves for maximum and minimum temperatures. Notice they don't have that dip in the 70s and 80s. They've been going up or pretty steadily the whole time. And at this point, maximum temperatures in spring are over two degrees above their long-term average. And people who live in the high plains probably would agree with me that urbanization is not the cause of this. Uh, but of course, March through May is pretty important for, for, for farming. Controls when the last freeze is gonna occur, controls the length of the growing season to a large extent. Um, a two degree change in um, temperature is about a week to a week and a half change in the growing season. And that is knowledge that could be useful to get the crop in the ground established earlier than you could have done before, which of course is important because the summers are warmer too. Here's East Texas. Compared to the one I just showed, the, the upward trend is a lot less dramatic. In fact, uh, summertime temperatures and fall temperatures are now only about the same as what they were back in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so uh, it's, it's change has not happened at the same pace everywhere. Partly that's due to natural variability having different effects. Part of it may be due to differences in, in the, the land use in different areas. But this is true, by the way, across most of the southeast United States. The, the long-term trend in, in temperature is not as great there as it has been in the rest of the country. And lastly, for my temperature curves, here's South Texas. Uh, the curve that stands out here is uh, the, the blue dotted line, which is December, January, February average minimum temperature, which matters a great deal for whether tropical plants are going to be viable. Uh, this suggests that in South Texas, the, basically you can translate this to say the latitude at which tropical farming is possible is gradually moving northward. Of course, that doesn't mean you have the water available to do that uh, until you get far enough north, but um, at least it means that you don't have to worry at present about the, the frequent ridiculously cold winters that you had during the 1970s. So here's the state curve again. And now, of course, what matters, as I said before, is not what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. Now, um, in the news, when you hear about climate change and projections, you'll hear generally one number being quoted that climate is projected to increase temperatures goes up by a certain amount. Or, or if you're lucky, it might hear a range. But it's really important when you're dealing with uh, forecasts which you don't have a lot of experience over to understand the limitations, understand what those forecasts are coming from, and what uncertainties have been taken into account. So for example, the to, to project future climate, you need to know the future composition of the atmosphere. So that's, uh, I've labeled emissions here. And we know pretty tightly what's going to happen to carbon dioxide. Any fool can look at the curve and see it's going up. It's going up fairly steadily. It's going to keep going up. Uh, we're not going to get rid of uh, fossil fuels anytime soon. A bigger uncertainty is how the climate will respond to this. Uh, there are different ways of measuring the sensitivity of the Earth's climate to a given change in its composition. And despite a lot of work, at this point, it's only, we're only starting to be able to narrow down the range of possibilities. It's still about a factor of two or a factor of three. So if we factor in the possible responses of the climate system, that envelope expands quite a bit. Next uncertainty is the fact that nobody is growing a crop that responds to the global average temperature. It's all what's happening locally. And the distribution of temperature change is another uh, factor that model, that's probably not going to be very large, but models may not get that very accurately either, so that expands our uncertainty a bit more. Uh, 
And then finally, um, these projections are based upon a subset of what affects the climate. They're based upon basically changes in atmospheric composition, in some cases changes in land use also. Um, since we don't know how to predict changes in the sun, they don't include what those possible changes might be. Since we don't know how to predict volcanic activity, we don't know what those possible changes might be. Um, at present, we're just now developing the ability to predict things like those long-term natural variations in the Atlantic and Pacific that I referred to earlier. Um, but there's still mostly a big question mark. So if you take that into account, not only have, do you have to take into account the fact that uh, you don't know what they're going to do in the future, but you also don't know for sure how the present climate is warm or colder than it would have been otherwise because of those natural variations too. So we have to expand the range of possibilities some more. And now it's looking like we're pretty darn clueless as to what's going to happen in the future. On the other hand, if we really were clueless, if we really didn't have any idea of what the future climate was going to be like other than, say, going by the historical record and knowing it goes up and down, up and down, and you looked at that graph, and you didn't think anything was changing, this would be your prediction. You'd be saying, well, we're still going to be hovering around zero. So the fact that we actually know some things about what's going to happen in the future, even if it's not perfect, that gives us a different window for which to plan than does the zero knowledge window. When you compare these, there's some overlap. And even if you're just looking at the next five years, there is significant overlap, but there's also a lot of things that are excluded because of the fact we know that many aspects of the climate are making things warmer than they would have been otherwise. And so that's the, the window by which, even on just a five-year time frame, people can take advantage of knowing that the climate is changing, knowing that scientists know basically why it's changing, and at least some aspects of what's going to happen in the future. I've illustrated this in terms of temperature. Of course, there are lots of things that uh, climate change impacts. Um, soil moisture decreases if you have more evaporation because of warmer temperatures. That reduces surface water availability. Uh, stream flow may go down or go up depending upon how much the heavier rainfall events compensate for the evaporation during the drier periods. Um, I mentioned longer growing season. Um, also, just the fact that you've got more carbon dioxide means that plants are able to actually grow better uh, in principle and not require as much water. And then, of course, all the things we don't know about because we've never been through this sort of climate change before. All those things can happen too. And those are things locally. Of course, uh, the ultimate success of a farmer in the market depends on what's happening in the rest of the globe also. And there are other global impacts beyond just changes in carbon dioxide, precipitation, and temperature. We've also got changes in which crops can be grown where. And it's not clear in the tropics that there'll be obvious replacement crops available. So um, that means that as the world is slow to adapt, you may well have greater market volatility because of unexpected weather events that are becoming more common now than they used to be. So I'll just wrap up with this, this parting shot, which is that climate change gives us an opportunity to get ahead of the curve. And while we can't predict the future, at least we have a fuzzy sense of where it's going, and it's not where it was before.